Change your heart, change your life, change the planet. It looks like there is a moose out here ahead of me. These boots, I would say, are five and a half inches wide, at least. Uh, so that's a big moose track. Hey everybody, Tim Van Orden. We're coming to you from the ground. <laughs> I'm in Woodford, Vermont today, uh, doing kind of a bushwhacky run. And I thought this is a great opportunity to share what's on my mind and do another what I've learned in the past 20 years video. I'm cruising around today uh, on a blue blaze trail that somebody made through the woods uh, headed towards the Glastonbury wilderness. And there's no uh, foot tracks or ski tracks and it's not an official trail. It's probably somebody's hunting trail and uh, there's no bridges over the streams or anything and, and a lot of it isn't even uh, really well cut so I'm kind of just wandering around trying to stay on this trail but getting lost and and finding my way back and at some point it'll probably just peter out and I will be wandering through the wilderness uh, at which point I will probably just key in on what we call Wildcat Mountain and just bushwhack my way up to the summit. So how that's relevant to this series of what I've learned in the past 20 years is that I approach goals very, very differently than I did when I first started this journey of running raw. Uh, and just throughout my life. And the way that I set goals now is much, 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 much more compassionate. And what I mean by that is that I no longer set a goal with the result being the desired outcome of that goal. To me, goal setting is not about results anymore. It's about putting myself in process. So like today, got to the parking lot, put my boots on, sat for a while with my feet in the ground, my butt still planted in the car seat, not really knowing what I was gonna do. In fact, it took me a while to even get to the parking lot. Like, where am I going? I don't know, I'm just driving east on Vermont Route 9 from Bennington. And there's national forest access for 15 miles once you leave Bennington and open or enter uh, the town of Woodford it's 15 miles of National Forest access lots of different options so I got to the Pine Valley parking lot and said okay this feels right and uh, I'm already off trail I've lost it uh, so now we're gonna start the bushwhack um, so got there got out of the car eventually uh, not knowing where I was going to go, not knowing what the workout was going to be. Should I take the snowmobile trail or should I take the power line trail? And then I remembered that I discovered this uh, rogue blue trail. So let's go see where that goes. That's it. That's the goal. And my process is all about that type of engagement now. But someone could look at my race results in the rear view mirror or even look at my race calendar ahead of me and say that, well, that doesn't appear to be the case because your race results are pretty phenomenal for someone your age or just in general. Uh, and <clears throat> they could look at my race calendar ahead of me and say, oh, I see the U.S. Mountain Running Championships in July 8th uh, is on that list. So it looks like you have a goal race, so therefore you must be engaged in some kind of plan, some kind of program right now to really knock it out of the park at the, the championships. Otherwise, why would you go? So it could look like that, but my process is not about 
or should I say my goal setting process is not about uh, achieving a certain result at that race or at any race. My process is always about gentle engagement, compassionate engagement with presence being the ultimate goal. So here's the difference between my old goal setting and standard goal setting and what I'm talking about now where present engagement becomes the goal. So in the old model or the model that's taught by people like Brian Tracy and Tony Robbins and, <clears throat> and many of the, the fitness gurus out there is that you set a big goal, that big goal is going to inspire you, especially if it's a big, hairy, audacious goal or a BHAG, and that's going to motivate you to step outside of your comfort zone. It's going to motivate you to see yourself as bigger than you've been seeing yourself, and you're going to get all pumped up and puffed up, and, and you're going to do more than you ever thought possible. Uh, whew, I'm back on the trail by accident. Ha! <laughs> so, and that's where I'm going with this. Uh, so you'll hear people say things like, keep your eye on the prize. Uh, keep your eye on the end or begin with the end in mind. Uh, or Brian Tracy in many of his books tells the story of a, a traveler who meets an old man in Greece and he says to the old man, excuse me, sir, could you tell me how to get to the summit of Mount Olympus? And the old man, who turns out to be Socrates, says, yes, just make sure that every step you take is in that direction. So I believe this for the longest time and most people that engage in a, a plan towards a goal also believe this. It's it's the common way to go about uh, achieving a goal, but it's no longer what I do. As you can see, I'm clearly not moving in one direction. Every step that I'm taking right now is not moving me towards some ultimate physical destination in the world. What I'm doing is moving myself closer and closer to the only destination that really matters to me. And that destination is me. Every step I take out here, I get closer and closer to myself, to me, to a me that is powerful, to a me that is positive, to a me that is fully engaged, to a me that is no longer mired in whatever narrative is happening back in town uh, with my business, my family, my relationships, uh, whatever narratives uh, I'm caught in there that don't feel good or are not empowering, they're gone the longer I'm out here. So my goal is always to find me. And I can't remember a workout, if you want to call it a workout. I can't remember a workout where I didn't find me at some point uh, in that process, in that movement. I always find me, because that's the goal. So if you look at the, the statement or the direction, keep your eye on the prize. Always keep your eye on the prize. Well, my question is, who is that a prize for? And why is it a prize? A prize means that something has value, that you have esteemed that finish line, that destination, that reward. You have esteemed it or estimated it to have a great value. You prize it. But what is it that you're actually prizing? And who is it that's making that evaluation or uh, esteeming this thing? And what I mean by that is that we often see ourselves as less than. That's the human condition. Uh, 
even people with so-called high self-esteem are always trying to protect it, uh, which is why I'm not a fan of self-esteem. I'm a much bigger fan of self-efficacy. You don't need to protect efficacy. You just simply need to engage, but esteem needs to be protected. Things that are valuable need to be protected. Uh, so who is it that's valuing this and why? So here you are with uh, low self-esteem, you're, you're not feeling good about your body, you're not feeling good about your uh, place in the world, your rank, you're not feeling good about your relationships, you don't feel respected, you don't feel seen or heard, uh, you don't feel valued. So what does your brain do? Hmm, let's come up with a goal, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And then let's imagine, let's simulate what's gonna happen if I can do that. Hmm, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Here I am. Oh, I'm crossing the finish line. People are cheering. I'm at the office the next day and people are saying, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. You're incredible. Women are swooning or or men or uh, attracted to you or giving you respect. You're, you're admired. You have value in that simulation that you just ran. You, you try these goals on. You're, you're like, okay, what do I get if I accomplish this goal? Let's imagine it. Let's simulate that. Me being the person at that finish line. Hmm, eh, I don't get a whole lot. But you're making this estimation or valuation inside of the context of where you have felt inadequate in your life, where you have felt less than. So your brain is filtering the world through these conversations of previous inadequacies. Uh, that's what the brain does. It remembers things that hurt more than it remembers things that feel good. So. In psychology, they call this a negative bias. That our brains preferentially hold on to information, events, and feelings that hurt more than they hold on to information, events, and feelings that feel good. Because if you remember things that feel good and don't remember things that feel bad, well, you're likely to get killed. Because uh, you need to know what things hurt, what things to avoid. Uh, your survival depends on it in our past. And we still have the brains of our ancestors. So we still have this preferential memory for things that hurt, things that made us feel inferior, inadequate, things that threaten our body and our identity. Because uh, if our identity is threatened, that's a sign that we likely have a low rank. That's a sign that someone in the group or the group is has rejected us or is going to reject us and therefore ugh, we might be kicked out on our own and uh, we could die. We most likely will die or the group is going to kill us. They're going to get rid of us. They don't want us around. So a threat to the identity is likely a, a threat to the body coming. So our brains try to fix that. How can I improve my rank? How can I improve my identity? How can I regain respect or value in the eyes of this group so that they don't try to kill me or get rid of me or abandon me? Uh, so this is serious business in the brain. This is not just play. This is serious life or death business for the human brain. So we set these goals. We imagine them uh, inside of the the filter of how have I failed in this domain in the past? Because my brain is holding on to that domain. My brain is saying, I got hurt there. I was threatened there. I was challenged there. I was abused there. I was rejected there. So that's important. Don't let it happen again. So what can I do to fix that? To make sure that never happens again? How can I show them? This was a driving force for me for most of my life. I'm gonna show them. You pick on me, you reject me, you alienate me, you call me names, you're cruel to me, I'll show you. I will definitely show you. Um, 
whether that's through trying to make an Olympic team or it's through violently lashing out or it's through uh, any manner of compensation. In our culture, we call it overcompensation. But it's not overcompensation, it's just compensation. It's a wound and we shame people that are wounded. Someone is rejected, someone is hurt, and instead of feeling compassion for them, what do we do? We shame them even further. Like, how dare you be weak? How dare you feel inadequate? How dare you try to improve your rank? Don't you see what your rank actually is? You are inferior. You should be ashamed. And any attempt by you to try to feel good, you should be ashamed of that. That's overcompensation. You should be ashamed of your goals and your your needs to feel significant or substantial in the cultural narrative or in the narrative of your peers or your group. So we set these goals, uh, or should I say, we imagine them, we run the simulation. Am I a hero in this simulation? Am I a hero if I can do this thing? Oh yeah, I'm not just a hero, I'm a badass. Because nobody messes with a badass. Nobody rejects a badass. Nobody attacks a badass, because there are consequences. If you mess with a badass, you better watch out, because they're bad and they're an ass. So they're likely to hurt you. They're likely to, to punish you. They're likely to pursue you. So our brains see being a badass as a, a good thing. Nobody messes with a badass. Which is why you have all these Navy SEALs coming out with books and podcasts that are getting a lot of popularity. They're uh, really getting some legs because they fit right in with this, this narrative. When that narrative comes from ancient wiring in the brain that's mixed with so-called modern wiring in the brain. This is not a mistake. This is not a defect. This is a human brain. Uh, it's not irrational. Uh, it's a human brain. Uh, and we need to learn how to work with human brains instead of continually rejecting them or shaming them or, or saying that, a, that the wiring of the brain is somehow inferior or faulty. No, it's human. Let's learn to compassionately work with it. And in order to do that, we first need to accept it and say, yeah, this is a human brain. This is the human condition. This is not a mistake. This is humanity. Oh, wow. In the place I've never been before. And there are huge windmills on the horizon now. Uh, see, that's the, the beauty of bushwhacking. The beauty of discovering yourself in the midst of uncertainty and in the midst of unknown is that you get to go places that you've never been. Inside of yourself, too. Can you see them? The windmills? And isn't that how life works? That we take things that are or adverse and we turn them into power. We use them to generate power. And that's what I'm doing out here. I'm using adversity to generate power within myself. So my goal is to generate power within myself. This isn't weakening me, this is strengthening me. It's the opposite of what people think. Doing this, engaging, putting myself in the midst of Physical uncertainty and physical labor helps me remove the narrative because the narrative is far more exhausting than simply being a physical human being moving through the world. This is what we're built for. We're built to move through the world. We're built to be physically challenged and endure. It's when we sit and ruminate and exist inside of our default networks, simulating, simulating, simulating good fantasy, or bad negativity. 
and eventually that simulating of bad negativity is going to lead to the simulation of uh, positive fantasy. I know what will fix this. I'm going to set some, some goal. I'm going to be heroic. I'm going to be a badass. And then we prize that, we value that, we say that it is, whoa, that just collapsed under me. You see that? The ice just broke. I almost went through. <sighs> and it's fun. And had I gone into the water, that would have been part of the workout, dealing with that. Um, <clears throat> I would find myself in the midst of that, in the midst of wet feet or smashed shins. So, who is it that is prizing that prize? So keep your eye on the prize. And when I listen to those words, I now hear them differently. Uh, to me, I stands for identity. I is your narrative. I is the, the abstract representation that you have of yourself. And when you're keeping your eye on the prize, essentially what you're doing is you're, you're keeping yourself in this abstract simulation that has value only at the end, only when your life and your body look like uh, what you imagined in the simulation. So you keep your identity fixed on that prize. You keep your narrative, your eye, fixed on that prize. It doesn't matter what's happening to your body. It doesn't matter what's happening to the feelings, the affect, the emotions inside of your body. They're relevant. Suck it up. Just do it. Harden the F up. Just be a man. Uh, all the other ridiculous phrases that are about denying the communication that your body is trying to have with your eye because your eye is so fixed on the prize your eye is so fixed in this narrative about how you're going to be heroic when this thing happens and suddenly the body comes along and says hey I don't feel good or hey you need to change something so I'm gonna I'm gonna put a feeling in your body I'm going to create an affect I'm going to create an emotion and I is like Leave me alone. I am binge watching this episode of my prize and me at the finish line. I don't have time for these feelings. I don't have time for these emotions. I've got an entire season of TVO the Badass to watch. Leave me alone. So we medicate with drugs, with alcohol, with binge watching so that we can remain in that fantasy so that we can remain unmoved physically. We haven't engaged, we haven't gotten our bodies into the world, but yet our eye is still on the prize. And that's where we live. And anytime somebody comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, uh, are you sure that's who you are? Are you sure that's your identity? Are you sure that there's value at that finish line, even if, even if your identity does align, are you sure there's actual value there? Or is it just narrative value? Uh, like for instance, I'm climbing a hill right now that's probably a 40% slope and heavy boots and snow and reality keeps telling me that I'm not strong here. But uh, if I have this fantasy of me being a badass mountain runner, I'm likely to push too hard here and fail. And I see this a lot in athletics. People that go out too hard. People that swing for the fences right out of the bat. And then they're disappointed because reality doesn't match what they did. Because they haven't practiced, they haven't engaged. They haven't been humble by the steepness of reality, by gravity pulling them to the ground, making their heart and lungs and legs work to exhaustion. 
they haven't experienced that enough because they haven't been in the world. They've been in their simulation. And in that simulation, they didn't feel pain. Or if they did feel pain, they loved it. They loved it more than everybody else. And they're proud of how much more pain they can handle than anybody else. Back to the Navy SEALs. I'm a badass. I'm the toughest man alive. I can take more pain than anybody. Why would you want to? What's the point? What do you win? Pain? Or a delusional sense that that actually has value and that matters? Your body's trying to tell you something and you're not listening because you're binge watching your hero show or your horror show, uh, depending on how long you stay in it. So don't keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye in check and realize that your eye, your identity, your narrative, your conscious self is a tool. It's a tool. Uh, we're led to believe in our culture that it's everything. It's the only thing. It's the only thing that matters, but it's actually the only thing that doesn't matter because it doesn't affect matter. It's ethereal. It's, it's neural firings in the brain. What matters is the physical you in the world, the, the one that's screaming at you saying, I don't feel good. Help me. Move me. Engage me. Give me purpose. Set me in motion. Let me interact and engage with other human beings. Stop hiding me away and isolating me and imagining that I'm incredible. But meanwhile, I'm scared and alone and I'm not engaged and I'm failing and I'm crying out and you can't hear me because you've got the volume turned up too high on the, the story of you being the, the badass, the underdog who finally shows them. Well, I'm trying to show you that that doesn't work. And then eventually I'm gonna die or I'm gonna become so sick and so racked with pain that you can't ignore me anymore. Maybe then you'll listen, because I don't have language, the body. I don't have complex cognitive reasoning skills. I don't have logic. I have biochemical functions. I have physical affect. That's the only way that I can speak. I'm like a, a small baby crying for milk, crying for affection, crying for attention. It doesn't have language yet. That's how most of you is. But we have this thin layer of conscious cognitive narrative identity and we think that's everything. But that's just a tool to make the life of our entire being easier. But instead, when we celebrate it above all else and we make our I the prize, because ultimately that's what it is, I becomes the prize. The prize is me, triumphant. Not the thing that I get, but the thing that I become in my own estimation and in my imagined estimation that others will have of me. That's the prize, me, center stage, in the spotlight, getting all the attention while my body dies in a chair, in a dark room, fantasizing about what my life could have been like if everyone had just gotten out of my way and behaved and, and gone along with my plan and saw how important I am. So, wow. Ah, I didn't expect to go there, but that's where I went. So, yeah, I'm going to the US Mountain Running Championships in July. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see what my body says. Right now it's on the calendar. It's not a must, it's not a have to, it's not a need to, it's a, huh, right now, I can. So let's see what I can do in the meantime. And what do I get at the mountain championships? It doesn't matter, I'm not at the mountain championships, I'm right here. Uh, and when you get out of these fantasies, when you get out of these narratives, when you get out of these simulations, you get into you, right here. And uh, so I put myself on the, or in the conversation about 
being in the U.S. mountain running championships, I put myself in that conversation and then I see who I am. It's a dance, it's a game. It's not about getting all the dance steps right. It's not about performing the dance perfectly or, or going through the musical piece perfectly. That's not what this is about. It's about saying, I just like to dance, put some music on and let me dance. And then maybe after a minute of dancing, I might say, you know what, I'm gonna change the song. Or you know what, I don't feel like dancing right now. And I'm not gonna force myself to dance. And maybe I'll go to the championships, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll perform brilliantly, maybe I won't. It doesn't matter because to me, all that matters is who I am in each moment. Sliding down the mountain. <laughs> That's really steep. That was fun. Oh, this is even steeper. Okay. Uh, oh, and there's a rock cliff. Let's try to find something less dangerous. So, who am I right now? That's the goal. That's the prize. I'm in a great mood right now. I'm feeling fantastic. Uh, regardless of what the physical result of this workout is, the result to my being is off the charts. And uh, here we go. This is like 80%. Whoa! Rocks! Oh crap. Yeah. That's fun. I have no idea where I am. I have no idea how to get back except to follow my tracks. All right. I think that's good. Is there some value in there for you? Uh, do you have your eye on the prize? Do you have a goal in front of you that is pulling you and, and the goal itself or the result at that finish line matters more than, than who you are in each moment? The moments of your life? This is a moment of my life. This is my life, not just finish lines, but right here. This is also a moment. Who am I? Am I living my life? Am I filled? Am I engaged? Do I fall on the ground and smile and, and get back up? Or do I give up as I slide into a stream? <laughs> okay, if you have some thoughts about this, please leave a comment. That's, that's where this becomes a community and that is something I really, really value. Even if I don't have a chance to answer all of your comments, I love to read them and to think about them and to process them. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you like this channel, subscribe. And if you want to help me do more of this and engage in more compassionate goal setting and to spread that word, then come over to Patreon, a buck or two a month. And you allow me to live simply and continue to do this kind of work. Uh, I don't need an extraordinarily rich material life. That isn't important to me. Obviously, if you watch my videos, this is what I value. Uh, you can't buy this. I probably spent 45 cents in gas to get here. Um, so I don't need a lot to enjoy the moments of my life or be in the moments of my life. But uh, your support does help. And it allows me to do more of this work and to work on my books. So thank you for those of you that are already on Patreon and those of you that have subscribed. I'm grateful that you are still listening, you're still tuned in, and you, you think that there is value in this process. All right. I'm off to somewhere that I do not know. But uh, I know who I am right now. And I like it. See you. I'm about 20 feet up in a tree right now. <laughs> Beautiful spot. I'm on the summit of what we call Wildcat Mountain now. It 
doesn't have a name except for Wildcat, which is a name that my dad's friend gave this mountain. It's in the Glastonbury Wilderness and it's uh, off of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, it's just so beautiful up here. All the beech trees and the spruce and hemlock and